Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Il me fait grand plaisir de vous accueillir au nom de la Chambre de commerce du Canada et de ses membres à ce deuxième sommet exécutif de la Chambre 2022 intitulé « Le chemin vers la prévention des pandémies », ce dont l'écosystème des sciences de la vie et de la santé a besoin aujourd'hui. Good morning. On behalf of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and its members, welcome to our second Executive Summit Series event of 2022, The Path to Pandemic Proof what the health and the life sciences ecosystem needs today. I'm Kathy Medjury, Vice President of Policy Quebec and Policy Lead on the Life Sciences Strategy Council here at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. While we are meeting on a virtual platform, I would like to begin today's events by recognizing the Indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today from coast to coast to coast. I want to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Mitzi, and First Nations people and celebrate the importance of the land that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. 2022 marks the third year of the global COVID-19 pandemic. And while Canadians and their businesses continue to wrestle with the fallout of multiple waves of COVID-19, There's also an undeniable shift towards living with the disease in our midst and working our way down the long road to economic and societal recovery. An important part of this shift is a collective departure from focusing solely on the immediate challenges facing us day to day, and instead beginning to look a bit further down the road, examining the events of the past three years and trying to discern what we can learn from them. An obvious starting point for this exercise is the Canadian health system and the sectors that support it. I don't think anyone would deny that the pandemic has exposed the fragility of our healthcare systems and its existing gaps. It brought into sharp relief the central role that the life sciences sector plays in our health and economic well being. It revealed the importance of things like cutting edge research, health innovations, manufacturing, global supply chains and data infrastructure. It also highlighted the extraordinary opportunity to position Canada as a global leader in all these areas. Other nations with similar health systems are investing in life sciences strategies as an important driver of economic recovery and growth, as well as public health emergency preparedness and security. Canada must do the same. We cannot risk being left behind or being caught unprepared in the event of another pandemic. In short, Canada must make moves to become pandemic proof in the future, which is exactly what today's executive summit is meant to address. Today's expert conversations will examine the barriers and opportunities to ensure that Canada has a robust, holistic life sciences ecosystem that spans the entire spectrum activities needed to improve the performance and resilience of our health system and to create a globally competitive sector. From innovation and workforce development to manufacturing, we have a lot to cover in just a few hours. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to get things started today by introducing our first session of the day, a keynote address by our special guest, the Minister of Health, the Honorable Jean-Yves Duclos, followed by a fireside chat between the Minister and Gordon McCauley, President and CEO of Admari Bio Innovations. The Honorable Jean-Yves Duclos has been the Member of Parliament for Quebec since 2015. He has previously served as President of the Treasury Board and Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Minister Duclos is a well-published author, conference speaker and economics expert. Prior to 2015, he was a Director of the Department of Economics and a tenured professor at Université Laval. Minister Duclos holds a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Alberta and a Master's and Doctoral Degrees in Economics from the London School of Economics. Monsieur le Ministre, bienvenue. C'est un honneur et un plaisir de vous avoir avec nous aujourd'hui. À vous la parole. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone, regardless of where you may be in Canada or even outside the world. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Thank you for the very kind invitation to this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to speak about you know, innovation and the role of life sciences, health and healthcare 
Thank you in particular to Gordon, uh, Gordon McCauley. Thank you, uh, Gordon, for your leadership and your partnership. And again, for the wonderful invitation to be here with you virtually uh, today. I, uh, this is an, a wonderful topic, which is on the question, the issue of what health and life sciences ecosystem will look like uh, in the near and the longer term future. I would start by saying uh, briefly that there is something we knew prior to, uh, to COVID. We knew that uh, health and healthcare were facing significant uh, challenges uh, even before COVID uh, related to the aging of our population and to the aging of our healthcare uh, workers. In the greater incidence with aging of chronic diseases, the greater incidence also of rare diseases, the increasing costs of drugs and technology, in particular for uh, the drugs and technology that are uh, more directly applicable to the, as I mentioned, the incidence of chronic and, and more rare uh, diseases. We knew that uh, prior to COVID, access to a family uh, doctor, to a family health team, team was a uh, challenging in many, many cases. On savait aussi avant la COVID-19 que notre système de collecte, d'entreposage et d'échange des données était un système imparfait et certainement incomplet, qu'il y avait beaucoup de difficultés à faire l'usage maximum et le plus efficace possible des nombreuses données qui sont utiles pour non seulement donner les meilleurs soins aux, aux gens, mais aussi organiser la mieux possible nos systèmes de santé et apprendre des, des leçons que les, 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 les efforts cliniques et les résultats de, de recherche fondamentale et appliquée peuvent nous donner pour améliorer à la fois les soins, mais aussi la technologie et les outils dont on se sert pour accorder ces soins. We knew also that prior to COVID-19, there were issues of equity, equitable access to healthcare services, in particular in remote, more remote and more, more marginalized communities in Canada, uh, significant issues around sustainability of healthcare expenditures, uh, the incentive structures, the long-term care, home care, mental health care. Uh, now, having listed all of that, you would say, what, what did COVID-19 uh, bring new? Well, COVID-19 just uh, made our system even more fragile and more vulnerable, uh, building on the earlier um, fragilities and weaknesses of our uh, health and healthcare system. So there will be, and there is a pre-COVID and a post-COVID world. Uh, Post-COVID will never be the same as we, uh, we had pre-COVID, Never, even though, as I mentioned, there were things, challenges that we saw uh, prior to COVID and that were uh, just being, uh, whose importance and nature were uh, reinforced uh, during uh, COVID. Now, there are therefore big challenges, uh, but there are also uh, big successes on which we can build in part because of the difficult COVID experience. COVID obviously brought us a number of, of, of challenges, including tragedies, uh, in all sorts of, of healthcare environments, obviously, including long-term care settings. But COVID also taught us some very good lessons and some good, uh, some good um, lessons on which uh, to build, including the tremendous uh, sustained and incredible collaboration between all levels of government. That collaboration uh, saved tens of thousands of lives during COVID-19. We saw in other countries a level of collaboration that was less sustained than what we saw in Canada, a level of collaboration in Canada that led to greater confidence in the measure that Canadians needed to follow to protect themselves and those they love. Et pour cette raison, on a à nouveau pu sauver la vie de dizaines de milliers de Canadiens, puisqu'on a au Canada, durant la COVID-19, un des taux, le, le deuxième taux de mortalité le plus faible parmi tous les pays du G7, Donc, un taux de mortalité faible, ça veut dire beaucoup de, de gens dont la vie a été sauvegardée, sauvée par ces efforts de collaboration, but also uh, significant efforts of contribution, including on the part, obviously, of the community, social sector, but equally importantly, on the part of the private sector. The private sector stepped up and was able quickly to contribute to the so-called war efforts 
of COVID-19, uh, for instance, obviously around the uh, provision and the delivery of billions of items of protective personal equipment, uh, therapeutics, uh, vaccines, uh, rapid tests, uh, all sorts of, of procedures and tools that the private sector, uh, because of its strong contribution, was able to bring to the fight against uh, COVID-19. Before I turn back uh, to you, uh, let me say that these are uh, significant health outcomes that were generated because of this collaboration between partners, including governments and the private sector. But equally, there were significant positive outcomes of this relationship, economic outcomes and fiscal outcomes in particular. We in Canada have been able to go economically through this crisis better than most other comparable and even larger countries like the United States. We, we, uh, we now have a, a rate of unemployment of 5.3%, which is low, the lowest level since uh, 1976. So it took us a relatively short amount of time to catch up with the significant economic damages that COVID-19 uh, inflicted on us. Et on s'est débrouillé mieux que la plupart uh, des autres pays, certainement en matière d'emploi, comparativement aux États-Unis, uh, par exemple. Ceci étant dit, le Canada a besoin de continuer à travailler fort pour non seulement euh, terminer la, la, la lutte contre la COVID-19, mais devenir une des économies les plus compétitives en matière euh, de, de, de capacité et de recherche et développement dans la manufacture et le développement de toutes sortes de techniques et de produits des sciences de la santé. C'est pour ça que je suis très heureux d'être avec vous ce matin. So pleased to be with you, with you uh, Gordon, uh, to be able to have this. Uh, this, uh, this, this panel, this, this, uh, this, uh, this discussion around the importance of health and li life sciences uh, ecosystem in our country. So thank you again and turning to you, uh, Gordon. Parfait, merci, Monsieur Ministre, and thank you for being here. It's very important that we that we have these dialogues, and I and I I applaud your commentary about the about the collaboration amongst government and uh, with the private sector as well, amongst governments and amongst the private sector. And and I wonder if 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 we might just start there and say, uh, what sorts of things should we be focusing on going forward? Uh, both to continue to protect ourselves against COVID-19, but also to uh, protect against the future economic shocks of uh, future pandemics, because it doesn't seem like we're done with this one. That's an excellent question. So A, you're, you're correct. Uh, this is what experts are telling us that we're not yet done uh, with, uh, well, we'd like to be done with COVID-19, but COVID-19 is not done with us. And, uh, and that's what we unfortunately are being told by experts. As you know, as we know, there will be new waves and new variants, and we need to be prepared for that in order to be better resilient, more resilient when those uh, shocks come. So what do we need to do is to be uh, more resilient in our capacity to adapt to these new shocks, which as we know, and as I just said, can come th through COVID-19, but they will come through other types of, of health uh, shocks in the future. We know there will be new types of pandemics that will have a severe impact on the health of human beings, but also animal and vegetable health. So, uh, the, and obviously, you know, the broader impacts of those types of, uh, of health shocks can impact uh, can impact uh, the, the economy, you know, agriculture, forestry. Uh, obviously, you know, the ability for human beings to protect themselves against the productivity, absenteeism shocks, uh, which have an impact, obviously, on our productivity and uh, and an income income both of households and uh, and businesses. So, what we need to do, therefore, is to be more resilient. That requires our healthcare system to have greater redundancy. Uh, until the beginning of COVID-19, our healthcare system in general was approximately 95%, operating at 95% of its total capacity. Now, 95% of total capacity doesn't leave a lot of redundancy, of resilience. So whenever there is a, sh a shock, a minor shock, and certainly a big shock, then our healthcare system can't, can't cope. And as we saw, that leads to lockdowns, school closures, uh, su you know, supply shocks, shocks uh, uh, supply chains being broken. 
uh, that's not good in the short term for our economy. It's not good for uh, our economy and workers in the longer term either. So we need more resilience. Uh, a greater, as we said, ability to manage and, uh, and share uh, data, uh, greater um, investments in the governance of how we, uh, how we deal with those shocks. In the longer term, more investments in infrastructure, in innovation, to which I could come back in a moment. In a moment I have some good news from budget 2022 and, uh, and other uh, ways, well, both in physical infrastructure, and human infrastructure that can make us more resilient to those future shocks. Thank you for that, and and, and let's and let's talk about those uh, investment things because obviously you're you're anxious to talk about them. So let's let's do that. But but I but I think it's important to say that you know historically people tend to think about uh, healthcare as an expenditure, and and I think a lot of us like to think more about the investment part of it, and you have some expertise in, uh, in economics. So perhaps you would talk a little bit about that link between investing in healthcare and investing in um, the health of Canadians and the economic output that results from that. Well, I'm pleased to do that. And I would uh, focus on four different points, linking the health and the, the economy. First, let's, let's remind everyone that uh, health care investments, these are not expenditures. Now, when we look after the health of Canadians, we invest in their health and well-being. We protect them, we promote their health, and we make those Canadians not only live better lives with greater well-being, but also more productive and healthier for a longer time. So uh, healthcare expenditures in Canada account for about 13% of total GDP. So about 13% of income generated in Canada is attributed to the, uh, the activities, the production activities generated by healthcare uh, production, the production of healthcare. Now, 13% of GDP and about 10 to 11% of the total workforce. So one out of 10 Canadians, and individually, we all know at least one healthcare worker, one out of 10 Canadian workers is a healthcare worker. So that's the baseline is very strong. Now that baseline, the second thing is that the, that baseline is going to grow over time. Healthcare and health investments are going to increase over time because of the uh, the, ish, the, 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 the the issues that I mentioned earlier, the aging population, the greater incidence of, of, of all, all sorts of diseases, the greater value and the cost of technology, uh, drugs, and many other things. So it's a sector of our economy which is going to increase both in relative and in absolute size. The third thing is that the investing in the healthcare sector is a great source of for increased productivity, not only obviously for the productivity of those workers that we care for and therefore make them able to live better lives and to be better at producing goods and services, but also because of uh, the healthcare investments that we make generate knowledge and innovation that benefit other sectors of the economy. Just an example, the, digi the digital uh, care, the uh, data um, innovation that we saw uh, in, in COVID-19, those types of innovative technologies are seen to be beneficial to other uh, sectors of our economy, just like investments in other sectors of the economy around digital, uh, the digital the numerical world, that also has an impact, a beneficial impact for the healthcare sector. And finally, um, there is a, a strong and growing connection between the health of people, the health of our economy, and the health of our natural environment. On these three aspects of global health, of one health, these three aspects connect each other. Uh, everyone, I think, understood has understood for a long time that the health of people is connected to the health of the economy. But more and more, we understand that the health of our natural environment, the quality of the air, the water, you know, the, the absence of pollutants, the, you know, the protection against communicable diseases, which are drawn, as we know, driven in part by uh, climate change and, and the lack of protection to our environment, that all feeds into the health of people and the health of our economy. So it's another reason for which 
I believe, and I'm told that healthcare investments will be key to keep growing our economy in the long and in, in, in the short and in the longer term. That's 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 really interesting. I think those investments um, are are critically important. And what, one of the other areas that I think we all saw in the pandemic is a bit of a reckoning uh, with our domestic capacity on a lot of fronts. You talked about the the capacity within the healthcare system specifically, but there's also the question of the of the capacity of the life sciences industry, uh, particularly from a biomanufacturing perspective. And I wonder if you might um, share a few thoughts about the investments that uh, you and your colleague, uh, Minister Champagne, have made um, with the Government of Canada in our biomanufacturing capacity. Well, that's an excellent question. And let me uh, maybe speak about the last two budgets in relation to that, because budget 2021 and budget 2022 are very complementary in mm -hmm. supporting biomanufacturing and life sciences investment. Uh, budget 2021 launched the biomanufacturer, manufacturing and life sciences strategy with an investment of $2.2 billion. Now, that obviously was driven by in, in good part by COVID-19. But as we said earlier, the challenges of building a stronger life sciences and biomanufacturing sector in Canada, that those challenges were there before 2019. For many years, we had seen a decrease, certainly in relative decrease, in the importance of those investments in our economy for many decades. So there is no one government to blame. It's been a, a trend for many, many decades. That, I, I think, was obviously unfortunate, both for that period of time, but obviously in preparing for, um, for COVID-19. Obviously, no one expected COVID-19 to be there, but we could, have been, we could have been more prudent and we could have listened more attentively to scientists that were telling us you know, that the probability, the risk of seeing such a, uh, a crisis was significant and increasing in time, in fact. Now, that was the key uh, building block of budget 2021. Then 2021 also incle increased uh, funding for um, fundamental science, applied science, and clinical science. So these are three connected blocks. Now, fundamental research uh, is obviously uh, designed in part to feed into applied research. And then applied research in the health sciences sector uh, sometimes has quick impacts on clinical um, clinical work. And in many of our health sector settings in Canada, uh, Gordon, that connection is very strong. You know, health uh, researchers, fundamental researchers working in partnership with uh, applied researchers often found in businesses, in, in R&D uh, settings, and then feed into the health uh, clinical uh, sector in a bidirectional manner. So they, they, uh, they obviously draw from clinical data in on assessing the, you know, the, the value of different technologies and different drugs and, and other uh, tools. So they, they use clinical data to feed into fundamental and applied research, but then there is an inverse relationship. So that, that knowledge, which is generated by research, is then used for clinical uh, purposes. So the Canadian Institute of Health Research, CIHR, received in budget 2021 a budget of $250 million to set up better uh, facilities for clinical trials fund. Now, clinical trials, trials fund are fundament, fundamental to building the biomanufacturer, manufacturing and life sciences uh, abilities in Canada. We need that because when we have clinical trials, we're able to generate the type of knowledge and then the type of use that is needed to grow the industry. In addition to that, there was an additional $250 million for uh, what we call a tri-council tri uh, biomedical research setting. So we have three research councils in the federal government that are jointly supported by this significant investment. Then in budget uh, 2022, we added more funding for the CIHR, to which I may come back in a moment, uh, on, in particular on the impact of long COVID, which is a very significant issue from a healthcare and a health perspective. And I know people listening will have been made aware of that significant 
issue challenge long COVID. We don't know enough about it, and we don't, and we need to know much more about it. And also about aspects uh, related to aging, like dementia and brain brain health uh, research. Again, keys uh, key in our in our overall strategy. Um, and finally, budget 2022 added another uh, three quarters of a billion dollars to uh, clusters or innovation clusters uh, that we were set up in 2018. Many of these clusters have been very useful for biomedical research, either directly, uh, in particular uh, through the use of digital technologies or indirectly by boosting our ability to be good at advanced manufacturing um, efforts uh, and other other examples of complementarities between different sectors of our economy. It's 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 really interesting because um, you know the it's back to your your original comments about the collaboration between different groups, whether it's government or government and industry. And how do you see that collaboration evolving? Because because clearly this uh, like long COVID, this is a long process and figuring out uh, how we work effectively together and continue to support each other, which was a sort of a natural human effort in the middle of the pandemic. But now we, as, as we start to get into more normal times, how do you see that, that relationship evolving and what sort of things should industry be thinking about to work collaboratively with government in that respect? Exactly that. Uh, COVID-19 showed us the, not only the value, but the process of collaboration. We've never been as, as, as connected as, uh, as, as during COVID-19. COVID-19 now made that absolutely essential. We know how to do it now. And, uh, and, and, and we need to continue uh, uh, doing that, not only because of keeping the fight against COVID-19. Long COVID, for instance, I may, I may open a brief parenthesis, affects about between 10 and 30% of those infected with COVID. Now, you don't need to be ending up in a hospital of, because of COVID-19 to have to be infected, to be post-infected with long COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, 10 to 30% of the population being infected, being effect, affected by uh, long COVID because of being infected by COVID. That's a large number of people. Many of them stop working, stop studying. They have brain fog, uh, chronic fatigue. Some have increased rates of diabetes, uh, heart um, thrombitis, uh, clots. Uh, it, it, it's very, uh, I don't want to make everyone afraid listening to us, uh, but it's an example of an issue in which we want to invest uh, because yeah. there must be ways to do, to address that in, in the longer term because of that collaboration, closing the parenthesis. But you know, just being, um, you know, just talking to each other and sharing our, our common issues and challenges and seeing how we can address them together. The federal government has been extremely active uh, during COVID-19. Now, 80% of all expenditures supporting workers and businesses have been paid for by the federal government. Uh, in addition to the Canada Health Transfer, an additional $69 billion invested in the health and safety of Canadians. It had to do that. But now that it's done, we want to return to a more normal and more responsible uh, level of, of investments that can only be done if we partner further and better with the private sector, because the federal government can't do everything. And do you think we need to do a better job of celebrating the successes in those in those collaborations? Because one of the challenges I think that um, uh, certainly people in industry worry about, and I suspect it's a frustration within uh, public policymakers as well, is the innovation process is a long one and, and it's an iterative process. And sometimes it's not obvious and, and you and your colleagues are making very significant investments in this space. Is it, it, is it frustrating that you don't necessarily see the, the output that quickly or, or I don't wanna say don't get the credit for it, but the, but the wins aren't celebrated as, as quickly as they, uh, as they might be in other, in other contexts. I agree. And it's not, uh, it, it shouldn't be, and it cannot be a, a thing around the government celebrating its success. No, it shouldn't be that. It should be, as you hint, I believe, celebrating the success of what we do together. And I believe 
and I hear that Canadians value that. Now, we all want to remind everyone of the challenges and the risk and the vulnerabilities. Canadians also want to hear about the good things that we that happen when we work, when we do things together. And in Canada, we've done very good things. You know, it's uh, the, 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 the outcome and the outlook could have been a lot worse than what we saw in the last two years. And that's because we, we had each other's back and we worked to, together. And that's, as I said, as you said, I think, uh, Gordon, that has a value and a benefit to, uh, to Canadians. It provides hope. And, uh, and, it, and it incites and encourages people to keep uh, being positive and optimistic for the future of our country. Yeah. I, think that's, that's, uh, I think that's really interesting. The, the other part of that that is intriguing in the context of the pandemic is that uh, essentially every vaccine and uh, most of the treatments have a little bit of Canada in them. And uh, you know, Canada has an extraordinary research enterprise found, based on investments made by governments for a long time, for, for, for generations for sure. Uh, and of course, within the context of the vaccines, as I say, and, and, and some of the treatments, we've seen the, the outputs of those uh, investments, even if they're part of a, of a, of a more global, uh, global impact. So, so how, do we do, uh, how do we do more of that? How do we encourage... Uh, the continued investment in that basic research, but also the commercialization component. I mean, you spoke a little about it, about about this earlier, but it'd be interesting to return to that and figure out how do we how do we do more collaboratively collaboratively like that to take advantage of of this extraordinary research enterprise that we have. That's a, a great segue to uh, something that I I, I believe is of is of value, uh, something that COVID nineteen brought to Canadians is an understanding of the amazing power of science and scientists. You know, the, the fact, as you said, that uh, prior to COVID-19, it would have been expected that vaccination against such a, a virus would have taken between five and 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we would have been in lockdown and closures for between five to 10 years before emerging uh, of such a, a crisis. So, but science and scientists surprised us. And that's a, 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 an outcome which all Canadians want to celebrate. And all Canadians now recognize that, that and that's good for the, for, for the federal, in, for the, uh, that's good for support to federal investments in biosciences and life sciences and the health sector in general. Obviously, we are in a democracy, so the federal government is going to do what Canadians want it to do. Uh, but the great news is that more Canadians now support strategic investments in those fields because of COVID-19. Uh, people understand the value of science and scientists and research and development and biomanufacturing, the connection between uh, technology and the, and the benefits of technology, technology development, and what it is being used for. It's a great context, great political uh, and social context in which to see the future of this uh, this industry. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because um, I, I think it's exciting that people uh, support science and believe in science and are, and are seeing the output of it. But we also hear pretty much every day about people being frustrated with science because it is, it is again, an iterative evolutionary kind of process. You learn something new today that advances the knowledge. So, so how do we maintain that, that level of support for, for science? How do we encourage people to continue to listen even as knowledge changes and advances over time? That's a, real, that's a very good question. Um, fortunately, as we said, no, severe, very uh, detrimental impacts like the like COVID-19 in some ways help help us, just like the increasing awareness of the uh, of the damages uh, uh, created by climate change and the lack of protection uh, for diverse biodiversity, clean water, clean air, clean soils. So Canadians uh, understand more and more uh, the counterfactual uh, value of not doing these things. They understand mm -hmm. what would happen or what would could happen if we didn't invest in these things. 
Um, so they understood that you know, it, yeah, it did cost significant resources to, uh, to develop uh, vaccines, but they understand that without vaccines, the counterfactual impacts on our society and our economy would have been tremendous. You know? And with, sometimes it's, it's better not to think about what these outcomes would have been. And the same thing for climate change and protecting our environment. Canadians are more and more understand that the absence of actions is a lot more costly than the investments we are making together in protecting their health and the health of their environment. So uh, I agree totally. There is knowledge, but there is also understanding. So how do we connect knowledge to understanding? Obviously, that requires a lot of careful and patient conversations. In politics, as some of us you will, will know, and in, in teaching, I was a teacher for many, many years, repetition is the only way to proceed. You know, repeating, repeating, and repeating until you are very tired of repeating and until people start to understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating, and and, and the and the challenge, of course, is that uh, uh, knowledge advances, and sometimes you've been what you were repeating yesterday changes a little bit, and you have to uh, you have to say it a little bit differently today, and and that may be the case again tomorrow. I agree, and one example is vaccination. Now, um, many so just two years ago, people didn't really understand what vaccination meant. You were vaccinated when you were a child, and in many cases, that was the end. Uh, yeah. And you didn't wonder or worry about whether you should be updating your vaccination uh, status. Well, with COVID-19, it's an entirely new world. We know that the two doses are not enough. So, but for some time, we thought that they could be enough. No, it's in, the first, in the early phase of our vaccination strategy, early 2021, uh, a primary series was two doses, Moderna, Pfizer, and we thought at that time that that could be enough, but we now know that that's not enough. We need a third dose, a booster dose to be protected both individually and socially against COVID-19. But as you said, that is a, a communication challenge because people yeah. say, oh, we thought two doses were enough. Why <laughs> exactly. now do we need three doses? Yeah, exactly. So let me let me just uh, finish with with one last question. So you know we talked about the um, the the little bit of Canada in every uh, every vaccine, and of course that was work that uh, Peter Cullis and colleagues and others began thirty plus years ago. Peter might not like me to remind people how long ago that was that some of that basic work work was done. Are, are you as excited today about the things that that we'll uh, hopefully be talking about in thirty years that's happening in uh, in Canadian basic research? Well, maybe before switching to 30 years from now, let me quickly uh, remind everyone that uh, our portfolio of vaccines was composed of seven different vaccines in, in the summer of 2020. So we chose, we, when I say we, scientists, like Canadian scientists you know, advised us to choose seven vaccines in a portfolio of, of vaccines. Six out of these seven have ended up being um, approved by Health Canada. That's a remarkable outcome, six out of seven. Now, again, the entire merit is due to, uh, to scientists in Canada. Now, out of these uh, six, three of them have, or, or have strong Canadian connections. Novavax, uh, as, as you know, is, 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 is developing a production capacity in Montreal. Uh, Moderna will soon, I believe, I don't know how soon, be able to announce where it will be uh, and how it will be investing in Canada. It will be most likely a connection of research and development and productive capacity. That's that's we understand from them is what they want to do, not only produce, but also have research and development capacities and therefore outcomes. And then there is Medicago, a much smaller company uh, a startup, essentially, which is catching up quite quickly using a technology that is nowhere else found on Earth, that can be good for COVID-19, very high rates of, of, of protection and safety, but also uh, flexible enough to adjust to other types of, of pandemics. Now, what will what we'll, we'll, what will we'll, we'll say each, to each other, uh, Gordon, when we meet in 30 years from now? I don't know. I might not be there in 30 years from now. But some on the screen or some listening to us might be there. And what we will probably say, again, is that COVID-19 brought 
historic challenges. You know, the, the, the biggest health crisis in a, in a, in a century, well, uh, generating the biggest economic crisis since the Second World War, and in fact, since the Great Depression in 1930s. But then we learned how to be better prepared for the pandemics and other health crises that we will see long before we meet again, perhaps in 30 years from now. Minister, merci beaucoup. Thank you for so much of your time. Really enjoyed the conversation and, uh, and uh, good luck in your uh, continued efforts on behalf of Canadians. Merci beaucoup, Gordon, à toute votre équipe et à la Chambre de commerce. Uh, on est très reconnaissant de votre partenariat et de, et de votre leadership. Parfait. Merci encore.